What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again. And this time we return with Juan of the Almighty Evil Dead. It is great to be able to talk with you. Thanks for coming back on the show today. Yeah, man, for sure. How you been? Everything great? Everything's been all right. You know, you know, just one day at a time and hanging in there, you know, uh, dying yeah. young and growing old all at the same time, right? Uh, yeah, I hear you, man. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, but thank you because what I love about Evil Dead's music, and I can't remember if I mentioned this to you last time, is that you make heavy hitting music for the best of times and the worst of times. And this new uh, album, Toxic Grace, perfectly is a testament to that. I think when you open up with FAFO and then the way that you end with the Death and Resurrection show, like I just think it's an incredible thrashing experience. Were you intending to just sort of like pick up where you left off after um, the United States of Anarchy that we talked about last time, or were you kind of stepping into new uncharted territory with this? Uh, kind of uncharted territories. The, the original plan was we wanted to do an EP, for just four songs. And um, we went in, recorded the four songs, sent it to the label and they really liked the material and they, they uh, persuaded us into doing a full album. So then it was like, okay, well, now we got to go back into the studio and rehearsal studio first, write songs. So it took a little longer. So we didn't, from that point on, we didn't really plan anything. We kind of just let things flow the way they, they did. And I was listening to the record the other day and, and, it's pretty amazing. It's kind of magical how everything kind of just flows together real nice. And, and um, yeah, it seems like it, we picked up where we left off, but it wasn't planned that way is what I'm getting at. Well, I mean, that's how it always is, right? You always go into the studio with one idea. I've always, like, I'm not a songwriter by any means, and I'm not in a band, but I think I could speak for everybody when I say that, like, going into something with an idea is usually going to come out in the other end completely different from where you started. Well, yeah. we. Uh, Alex, on, th on this record, uh, we went in with one producer. Uh, we started with one producer, and we ended up working with two producers. That's something new for us as well. We, you know, that was completely uh, not planned to do that. Uh, we just, but you know, that's how it worked out, and, and I think it worked out for the better. Yeah, and I think like I mean, when you look at Annihilation of Civilization or The Underworld, I mean, it just seems like every album. I mean, every Evil Dead album has something about it that makes it an Evil Dead album. But it also seems like that there are experimental qualities that almost make every record stand out, right? Absolutely, we uh, we didn't set any limitations on this album. I know a lot of bands may say that as well. Um, we kind of just let the creative process flow um, and. You know, that's the end result is Toxic Grace. I, I, I enjoy, there's a lot of songs on here that really kick ass and there is a lot of experimental stuff going on. It's some new territory for us uh, that we've, you know, haven't charted before, but um, yeah, it was, a, it was a grueling album to put together. I thought it'd be a lot easier. The first four songs, it just went by real, real smooth. And then, you know, we, we took some time off to, to tour Europe which was kind of a blessing because it gave us the opportunity to really uh, listen to where we were at at the time. And then by the time we got back from Europe, um, we finished up and we had a clearer vision of what we wanted to do with this album. Um, I do need to ask, though, because the last time I spoke with you, it was in 2020. We were promoting United States yeah. of Anarchy. And the good news is, is that the world hasn't really gotten much better since we last spoke. So I think it's fair to say that there was no... A lack of inspiration for the making of this album, either, right? No, it, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. We, we, it's, I mean, just look around everywhere. It's what's going on in the world. A lot of chaos and disorder. Uh, you know, we really are very optimistic people. You know, <laughs> it just seems like the last two albums, uh, have, with all the things going on in the world, um, sure gave us a lot of topics to write about. That's for sure. Yeah. Does a topic influence your hand with how it translates to the riff? Do you like watch or see or hear something and that maybe sort of dictates the chord progression or the riffing style or your technical? Uh, for for me, for, for Annihilation, for on, the, on the debut album, yes. On this record, not so much because uh, our vocalist Phil Flores wrote like 99% of the lyrics this time around. So... Um, it starts with a, the songs always start with a, the new songs that started 
with a guitar riff and and our my partner Albert Gonzalez he has an arsenal of riffs so we n- never have a shortage on ideas so he would present his ideas to me and our drummer Rob and then we sit there we decipher okay from there we decipher like the beats and I'll add some riffs or or not depending if it needs it and we build it that way and then we present it to uh, our singer and then we get in the garage we do it old school on this record half of it was done old school meaning we went into a garage you know old school style and 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 hammer out the riffs and then we make some demos so it's like a process um but you know you could get you in the past we have been inspired by uh lyrical topics first that could inspire a riff especially because you know playing with so many different bands from you know when you play with ice t who has you know a lot of his lyrical ideas and messages he wants to convey it seems like you are able sometimes as a guitarist you're able to just go full in pedal to the metal nothing dictating you but then it also seems like that there is like for instance uh bloodlust this is why we ride i think it's the best ice t song song ice t's ever sang on best body count song one of my personal favorite rap songs of all time the way that it's just dreary but then it has that groove and sludginess to it and then hard hitting it seems like the there is a lot of emotion and a lot of sort of like uh heart not to say that there isn't heart in the other stuff that you did but like your right. heart moves a different way depending on who you're playing with and what it's about yeah i mean i could tell you a story about uh, this is why we were right we were working on that song we were in uh, phoenix arizona um we had a lockout for like a month when we were doing the writing sessions that, and then we had a show in Tempe, uh, Arizona at this place called the marquee and that, and ice wanted to play the new song. And we we're like, well, we haven't even recorded it. He wanted to like, just test it. And dude, it was crazy. The first time we played that song, I saw people crying. I've never seen people cry to a song. So it is a very emotional song for sure. Yeah. So that was a pretty trippy experience to see that. What it, what it is about that song too is like, for instance, you know, my life growing up and the life I live now is beyond different from Ice-T or Vince or anybody in Body Count. Yeah. But that musically, it just relates to me so much. Like it, it I never grew up in the hood or been involved in gang life or anything like that. I never even been arrested. And like, still there's something about that song, the melody that just flows through me that just really resonates with me in a very profound way. Yeah, no, I agree with you. The, the lyrical, the aspect of that song is, is very, it's hard hitting on the point, for, on point for sure. When it comes to uh, get, because I feel like every riff that you create captures a moment too. I feel like that there is no other you when i listen to uh an evil dead song or what or whatnot like it it never repeats the emotion that i felt when i first heard it like it always has a new moment when you work on something for a very long time though you know because i feel like that there is like a lot of structure and a lot of arrangements sure. does it make it more difficult to sort of capture a moment the longer you work on something hmm that's a good question um i haven't really thought about it that way um well, you always want to do your best. So in the cat it to capture the I think the more you work on it the, the more you you realize that um that it is important to to have something that's uh catchy and and that's has the all the uh elements to to make it I try to when we work on songs we try to make it timeless, something that's going to hit like for example, and I think Annihilation of Civilization is still the topics are very are still current to the stage. So we try to make stuff that's kind of timeless for sure, and we try to have fun with it. You know, you can't lose the fun aspect of it all because I think it's important to have fun when you when you work on music and art in general. Especially because I feel like that there's such a rawness to it, and every band that has like thrash or punk or hardcore roots to it, I love asking this question because it's so live like I feel like I'm listening when I listen to an Evil Dead album it still feels like I'm at like the live show because of the rawness and the intensity of it yeah. but when you're in a studio space and you know you're you know the studio is a very static and sort of confined environment and whatnot, and you know there's a lot of precision involved how do you sort of capture that raw energy in a very sort of controlled environment yeah you, you that's that's another good point you make um 
live, you know, it's a free for all. You just, you, you just don't know what's going to happen live. I mean, it just, it is what it is. I, in the studio, you're more focused. Uh, this time around, we, we followed a, a click track very closely on the recordings. Um, yeah, I mean, we're more in, a, in kind of in a surgical state of mind when we're recording, and and yeah, you, you want to capture that energy. Sometimes you feel the songs are, oh, man, we're playing this too slow. We got to record this a little. Let's, let's play a little faster. So yeah, it, it's kind of like trial and error when you record, and you got to go back, listen, and see if, if see if the the spirit of the song is 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 on tape or now digitally or however you record. Yeah. Um, and here's a silly question too, because every guitar player I've interviewed will always say that a song always starts off with a riff. Do you think we'll ever yeah. run out of riffs one day? You know, that's a that's a <laughs> you, you're on point today with the good questions. Uh, <laughs> do you think you, you? I don't think you do, man. I mean, it's possible, but um, I mean, I, I have files of, of stuff. I know Albert has a bunch of ideas. You, yes, our bass player Carlos. He probably has a bunch of ideas that we haven't even touched. Dude, I got like 30 minutes of music that I haven't even, like, we haven't even touched it, it from years ago. And I know Albert has the same thing. So, yeah, it, it's, it, it's kind of, uh, I don't think so, honestly. Okay. I mean, the, the, the important question would be, are the ideas good, though? <laughs> because, you know, you, you, the judgment, sometimes you don't feel like it's up to par or, or is this going to work for Evil Dead? So, yeah, I don't think we'll run out of ideas. It's just artists are very, you know, very picky as far as is, is this good enough or is it do I really want to go this direction on a song? So it's on this record, we didn't put any limitations and, and you just got to record and see what comes out. And then you can always can it. Right. Yeah. And, and not put it out. Of course, of course. Or you could always, or you could always get a harp, and then you have an unlimited amount of strings you could use to. Uh, to... There you go. Right. <laughs> but exactly. You mentioned that being live, it's a free for all, which I agree. Especially you know, watching you play, yeah. you go full on into it. But let's also be real: when you're playing at a venue, um, you know, there's sound checking. There's certain presets you have to put in your amplifier, your pedal settings. Sure. You got to make sure you're in tune and stuff. So, is there almost kind of like an art? to mastering the chaos in which you portray in your music it's yeah um so when you do headlining shows you have more time to set everything in 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 a proper manner and and get ready for the show and and yeah there's a lot of things going through your head you know is it does it sound right uh sometimes your pedals won't work i mean there's all kinds of uh scenarios going on um now, when you do some festivals, that that's where the nerve wracking and the free for all atmosphere is more alive because it, it really you only have forty minutes, thirty minutes to set up because they're switching bands out so quick. So, I enjoy doing this with Evil Dead because we're just kind of we just go for it, man. I mean, we just plug in and go. But um, the anticipation is a, is a ner is a bit ner nerve wracking. But when you're on tour, um, you, you know, after the first three four shows. It, it kind of everything just starts flowing really easy and you're more relaxed um yeah but there's nothing like the the chaos of in of the music and and i call it like i hate using the term controlled chaos but that that's kind of what it's like when you play live yeah and and but and, and you know what i think the term controlled chaos is actually because like i saw a, a jazz performance one time that was doing the traditional where they do something rather abstract and they call it avant-garde to try to make it sound yeah. intelligent. But every instrument was out of tune. Every instrument, there, there had to have been like 20 musicians on stage with a different wow. instrument. It was unbearable to listen to. Like it just was an assault. Like I, I left early because it was, everybody was out of tune. It was like more performance art in a way. So like I'm sure. all believing in chaos. I love, you know, hardcore and punk rock, but like there's sure. still a structure behind it. You listen to a Sick there of It is. All song, there's riffs and structures and arrangement. I listen to what you do in Evil Dead and there's definitely like, uh, uh, an element like an armature that holds it all together. So I do think yeah. that there is such. Just because something is chaotic doesn't mean that it's true raw punk rock. There is also has to be some. I don't want to say rules, but there does have to be some sort of like uh, whatever the opposite of chaos is. Some sort of structure to make your chaos eligible. You know. Yeah. Well, the arrangement is important. I think that's where you're 
trying to get to. Yeah, the order of the arrangements. That's what we really pay, try to pay a lot of attention to the to the arrangements of the songs to keep every, all the chaos in, in order and in check. And and um, that's something we paid a lot of attention to on this record. Does and live too. You know, in live too, we 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 keep we we. Uh, we do make a lot of eye contact when we play live. <laughs> yeah, which, hey, I give you a lot of credit. I think, but then there is also sometimes where a band, like for instance, um, Apples and Oranges too, but you take an artist like Smashing Pumpkins, for example. They're, yeah. not, they're not moving around on stage and, you know, yeah. throwing shit. They, they, they are very static, but that's all about just them singing the song and letting you go off in your own worlds in a way. I think, sure. like, sure. look, I've seen plenty of, like, rock bands that are not, punk at all and they're moving around all crazy and it is almost kind of cringy at times i will admit right no i understand where you're getting at yeah I, I've, I've seen billy corgan live and even like david gilmore and pink floyd and even the roger water sets and, and yeah there's not a lot of movement going on but there's so much instrumentation and, and it's it's just, it's amazing man the, the power of, of live music and it's just it's nothing like it man yep I'm going to dig up, and we're going to go way back in the past, because next year, I feel like, is a very important year for you, as it's, I believe it's the anniversary of the first album we ever heard, the Vicious Attack Arbitor album. Um, wow. Yeah, just going in the mindset, so much evolution, because not only did we get Fantastic Evil Dead, we got Agent Steel, we got the rec- record that you did with Terror, we got um, you know a lot of great albums since then, but the Arbiter, you have your whole first, your, your whole life to make your first album. What was the sort of mindset in 1984, 1985 that led to Vicious Attack? And is there anything from those sessions that maybe you still carry with you when you're playing to, today? Well, that's, that's a good one, man. Um, I remember... One of the big inspirations that I, I was really into, like wh- reading horror novels and stuff. That's how Screams in the Grave came about from, from reading horror movies or horror, horror novels. And um, well, it actually started with Metal Massacre Four. The song was on Metal Massacre Four, but we use it on the Screams on on the Vicious Attack album for sure. Um, I say Motorhead was a huge influence uh, on us for the. We used to listen to Motor, Motorhead a lot and Iron Maiden. So those two Iron Maiden killers, I, the first Iron Maiden record, I don't think, uh, no, I don't think the number of the beast was out yet. So it was the first two Maiden albums and the pre, and, and the Motorhead albums had a huge impact on the Abattoir um, album, The Bitches Attack. Also some Merciful Fate influenced us. Oh, oh yeah. As far as what I have from those sessions or anything, I, I have like a few test pressings of like, the song Don't Walk Alone, which is one of the, it's on the B side of, of the album, because we took it to radio and we, they picked up Screams from the Grave and then we pressed another 45. Back then it was all 45s and stuff. And I know I'm dating myself here, but um, I have some pretty cool, like one, I think one copy of Don't Walk Alone test pressing. It, it, I think there was like three made, one went to radio and it, it, I don't know the producer kept one and I kept one and maybe mm-hmm. my, our bait maybe those four so yeah. well yeah and that was a good, fun album man yeah. for sure feels good to feels good to listen to that and be negative eight years old again I must say dude <laughs> you know I, I've I've gotten the the itch to uh, want to add screams in the grave to to our life set uh, for Evil Dead you know it's maybe something we may try down the road I, I don't know if we I don't want to re-record the song or anything I just to add it, just to celebrate and play that song live. It, it's a powerful song, and I it just it just uh, has so much Motorhead influence. I, <laughs> it's crazy. I, I, I see the Lemmy that's in you, and, yeah. And, and but yeah, you sure. also have your own evolution too. So while I yeah, see of course, Lemmy, of course, I see Lemmy in your DNA, of course. But like, yeah. you, you evolved just like he did in your own specific way, which I think you did what Motorhead was all about. Learning from them and then making I, it your own. Not just ripping them off and, you know, No, to no, no, them. no, no, exactly. They, the whole band was inspired by Motorhead for sure, man. And, 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 and I, I gotta give credit also to the Iron Maiden, you know, Steve Harris and Adrian Smith and Dave Murray. I mean, all, there's so many great artists at K.K. Downing, Glenn Tipton. I mean, you know, the list goes on, right? Rudolph Shanker, Michael Shanker. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. Those, are, those are the greats in my book. Willie Roth, 
Yeah. All of them. And you know, what's interesting too is like, I've always said that music, or like, especially like an artist's catalog, is the best representation of how time is relative. Like, confession, like um, United States of Anarchy, that was my first Evil Dead album because the last one came out when I was, uh, when I wasn't even born yet with the underworld. Wow. So like, like this was my so I discovered United States of Anarchy and then I went back and listened to Annihilation and stuff so that doesn't take me back to the late 80s or early 90s so I would say that the underworld takes me back to 2020 I like the way that people could say oh I remember when that album came out in 92 and seeing them play at this I could say wow I remember when the un- I remember listening to the underworld for the first time in 2020 and just getting in to Evil Dead at that time and and you know being able to interview Juan to promote that uh uh, during that time, so I've always said that music is never stuck in the year that it comes out. No, it's yeah, we we you're right, absolutely. It's it's emotional. It's 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 timeless. Music is timeless, and and it's uh, it's great to capture the spirit of the song and and the and, and what's going on and uh, around you at the time, and it's it sticks for sure. Mm-hmm. And there was one final question I wanted to ask you, and this yeah. is actually um, I'm asking for my own personal uh, uh, inspiration, um, being an artist myself. But when you look at your earlier – look, every artist, whether you're a musician or a painter or an actor of some sort, all look at the early work with some disdain or whatever. But yeah. like – and you know, we all want to evolve and get better. Do you just – how do you make peace with the earlier material that you make sometimes? And like do you just say, look, I was young. I was learning. But like – how or do you are you able to just look back at it with fond memories and be grateful for that as well that's a good question man i mean yeah you you listen to some of some of the stuff you listen to you go man we could have had a few more days to mix that song or if i could have just had a few more takes on that song yeah you know it's sometimes you you think about those things but you just kind of like for me I, i just think ahead you know, stay in the moment and think ahead of, I try not to look too too far back, you know? But um, yeah, you, that's a good question, man. I mean, I, I think it depends on the song, depends on the artist. Um, for me, I, I just, I just, like I said, man, I, I like to have fun with the music and I just remember the fun times for sure. Do, do you believe that you have control over your, your own evolution? Can you actually like, dictate where your evolution goes or does that just have to happen naturally and kind of go with the flow and let the evolution sort of come when that it decides to come yeah I, it, you know that's i think it's every person's different it's a collective consciousness uh you got to really focus in the, from the inner self and, and and see uh where you're at with everything and and i try to be as optimistic as possible and and stay on a positive mind flow uh, I think it's important, as not just as an artist, but as a person. It's just to uh, because you mentioned the word evolution. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at it from an infinite realm, uh, that's probably the best way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, and you got to keep yourself grounded as well. Of course, and look, I've 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 been doing interviews since 2017. I've done over 2,000 of them at this point, and like you know, I look back at some of those early interviews and like, what a fucking socially awkward, uh, you know, whatever. Right. And and I still am, but like you know, you 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 get, you get better like over time. I feel like. Like I have sure. different ways of wording the questions. I look back at the interview that I did with you uh, uh, four years ago, and I could have worded things better. I just like it's like you want to kick yourself in the nuts because you feel like that that is almost like oh, I'm being self critical. I'm being hard on myself, so I don't make that same mistake. But you also right. have to learn to make peace with those mistakes. Yeah, you know? and then sometimes the elements are on you. You know, when you're doing an interview, like I, I remember doing one that uh, was. Uh, what I had to do it on my phone because where I was at, it, it just, it, you know, I didn't have a, a, a internet access. I mean, I guess it could have been rescheduled, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of chaos around that goes around with it. So it's some things you can't control and, and you can only control certain things. And so it, it's, you shouldn't be too critical of yourself is, is probably what I would say to that, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, just, 
keep it positive, you know? Yeah, I watched the movie Whiplash uh, a lot, and, you know, the, the yeah. famous quote, there's no... What, what a great movie, huh? It's a fantastic movie, and part of me wonders if that teacher actually had a point. There are no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. Like, granted, you know, calling a bunch of people homophobic slurs and, you know, like, getting physical with people is not good, but, like, you, I, I sometimes I wonder... Like, sometimes I wonder, I, I'm always worried that whenever I get a compliment on anything, that it makes me, that, 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 that's almost dangerous in a way, you know what I mean? Right. So. Yeah, yeah I, I never really thought about it that way, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, you wonder sometimes, right, are these certain things. Um, yeah, I guess that's why some people are socially awkward, you know, dealing with, they don't like dealing with certain people and stuff, right? I mean. Yeah. Like introverted. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, I think that I'm, you know, I'm a people person. I, I, I get along with, with people, and and I just keep it positive, man. But yeah, it's never great to blow smoke up people's asses either, you know. Yeah. And tell See, them to do a good job. That, that's. Yeah. I think just being honest is, is a good policy. Yeah, of course. Um, and you know, save all the negativity for the art because the negativity exactly. in, in the no, in you're right. Negativity is great fuel for art. Is it's great fuel for the artistic process, but I don't think it's great fuel for the presentation of the art. I think is the best way. Absolutely, to say it. dude. You couldn't have said it any better. I couldn't say that any better. Than how you just said it. Thank you. I think, but I wouldn't have been able to say that just now. I don't think if it was for this conversation. So uh, thank <laughs> you. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you for another fantastic interview, and most of all, though, thank you for just continuing to give us amazing music that the world very much needs that resonates. I'm excited about it, man. I, I think this uh, new Toxic Grace record, I, I, I listened to it in its entirety. And it, it's like, wow. We just, I, that was, we just went 40 minutes of music there. And it's like, you know, I had to hit it repeat because it's like, so it, it's kind of cool when you, you know, when you play a record and you got to listen to it again. It reminds you, well, when was the last time that, you know, you know, I think back, okay, the Judas Priest records I would play over and over, Rain and Blood as well, the Slayer record, you know, that was a short, kind of short record, but it was so much riffing going on. So, you know, this one felt like that to me as well. Like it's, I wanted to play it again on repeat. So, yeah. so I'm excited about it. And I can't wait for everybody to hear it when, yeah. once it's finally out next week. It really has, it's a thrasher piece. That's what I call it. It is definitely. Yeah. Open. Is there just some, anything else with the release of Toxic Grace that you would like to promote in terms of upcoming shows you could be expecting or anything that yeah. um, you'd like to plug? We, we booked the show. Um, I'm going on tour with Body Count in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're doing Europe all of June. Uh, we have a single coming out, Psychopath, uh, on Friday with Body Count. So I'm, I will, uh, I will be with Evil Dead August 16th at the Terragram Ballroom. With um, we're playing with Whiplash, their 40 Years of Power and Pain release. I'm very excited about about that show. It's going to be playing the material off the Toxic Grace record, so I'm super pumped about that. And we got added to the California Death Fest 7 in Oakland in October. Um, that would be with Sodom and Sacrifice, Evil Dead, a bunch of other bands on there. So, yeah, man, these two West Coast shows I'm really excited about. I mean, I get excited about every Evil Dead show, but these are important because we're playing and, you know, we're pushing the new record. We're going to be playing new material. So I'm really stoked about that. And there'll be other shows coming up. And... Um, yeah, um, those are the two right now, but we got other stuff, cook other stuff cooking as well. Hell yeah, just bring it to the East Coast one day here in New York. Please. Well, yeah, that's 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 the goal, right? Yep, absolutely. But thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Alex. One of Evil Dead. Be sure to check out Toxic Grace. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Thank you.